ask you today, no one exiting the building, no one talking to your neighbor, putting all phones and electronic devices away, I have a word for you today. From the word of the Lord, the Lord has arrested me over the last couple of weeks to deliver this word. Before I deliver this word today, we want to pray for every man, every woman, every young person that God would open our heart, our mind, our spirit to what thus saith the Lord. And so would you raise your hands right now and those of you that are full of the Holy Ghost, would you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost before we deliver the word of God today and ask God to speak to us. That's it. Forget who's on your left. Forget who's on your right. Forget who's in front of you and behind you. And just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. God, I receive from you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you for that which you're going to do. For Lord, you have given me a word for your people. Help us, Almighty God, today in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Just remain standing. Before we read the word of the Lord today, I want to say to Elder Brian, marvelous job this morning. Didn't he do a marvelous job today? Marvelous, marvelous job today. Musicians and singers, I thank them for their help today, ushering in the presence of the Lord. Give them a great big hand of appreciation. Let them know you love them. Let them know you appreciate them. I haven't come to preach an evangelistic message today. I've come to preach to the people of God today to remind us of something very, very, very important in the day and hour that we are living in. I want you to grab your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. I've learned a long time ago just to do what God would have us to do. and Be obedient to the Lord. Mark chapter 6. Beginning with verse 1 and reading through verse 6. If you're ready for the word of the Lord, shout amen. amen. The word of the Lord says this, And he went out, referring to Jesus. Everyone shout Jesus. Jesus. And went he out from thence and came into his own country. Everyone shout his own country. Shout it again, his own country. Shout his hometown. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Then verse 3, you, you find that they begin to ask some questions, and they say, Is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and of Judah, and Simon. And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Verse 5 says, And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around about the villages teaching. If you look at verse 4 again, it says, But Jesus saith unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And verse 5 says, And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and he healed them. By the help of the Lord this morning, for the next few moments, I want to preach to you on this thought, the danger of the familiar. The danger of the familiar. Would you turn to your neighbor and say those words with me this morning? The danger of the familiar. Say it again. The danger of the familiar. Would you lay your Bibles down this morning? Would you raise your hands again? And let's pray a special anointing to rest upon the word of God today. Lord Jesus, we come before you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And God, I thank you for the touch of the Holy Ghost. I thank you for the power of Almighty God. I thank you for your abiding presence today that is among your people. Lord, I thank you for the word that's about to come forth. And God, I know that through that word, you're going to do great and mighty things. I give you praise right now. May the Spirit of the Lord rest upon your people, quicken our minds. Help our minds to be alert and loose our tongue that we may speak to your people this hour. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone shout amen. As you're being seated, would you put your hands together and give God praise again? Everyone shout again, the danger of the familiar. There is an old saying that familiarity breeds contempt. Mark Twain once said, it is better to be careful a hundred times than to be killed once. Think, think about this, 80 of every 100 accidents that happen in the workplace are ultimately the fault of the person involved in the incident. What does this tell us? Well, it's safe to say that workers are not taking the proper precautionary measures before working. Or they are simply too lazy to be bothered with it after all. They do their jobs every day, right? So why do they need to waste their time with tedious things like inspections and precautionary measures? Well, consider the above statistic. There should be an ample amount of evidence to convince lazy and neglectful workers to start paying more attention to correct safety measures. In studying this aspect of the workplace, we we find that a majority of workers seem to like to find things to blame when workplace accidents occur rather than the root causes of that situation. And I begin to think about that, about what the root causes may be to, to bring about an accident in the workplace. And could it be because of shortcuts? Everyone shout shortcuts. Humans are notoriously lazy, so taking shortcuts is a rather common practice in all of walks of life, nor necessarily work alone. Simply put, shortcuts that are taken on the job are not actually shortcuts. They are simply increasing your risk of injury or worse, death. Another root cause could be overconfidence. Everyone shout overconfidence. When workers walk into work every day with the attitude that it'll never happen to me, they are setting an attitude that leads to incorrect procedures and incorrect methods and tools while working. Then there is the root cause of familiarity. Everyone shout familiarity. This is probably the worst thing that any employee at any level in the organization can do. And that is becoming too familiar with the task at hand. Deliberately neglecting set safety procedures in the workplace can cause severe injury and harm to yourself or a catastrophic occurrence to others. The question may be asked today, why do pilots use a pre-flight checklist before taking off? If you have ever flown in a plane, you are very thankful that those pilots use a pre-flight checklist before taking off. Some, some would think that it is a silly question, right? Why do they do that? Well, let me tell you this. The consequences of a mistake problem are big. And so going through the plane and plans before taking off is of great value. Well, actually, it is critical for experienced pilots to use pre-flight checklists because there is an inherent danger in the familiar. When you have done something many times, you become familiar with it. When you are around something every day, you become familiar with it. When you see it every day, you become familiar with it. When you see it in operation every day, you become familiar with it. So your attention level drops and complacency sets in. And this means that you might forget to check something basic or you, or you might not realize that conditions have changed and, and that your normal course of action is no longer optimal. And so when we are familiar with something, we have a tendency to go on autopilot and that's when we are in a danger zone. Let me tell you today that too many find themselves walking in that danger zone of the familiarity. It becomes too familiar so I don't see what I need to see. And it becomes too familiar so I'm not as attentive as what I used to be. I, 
It's become too familiar so my response time is not as fast as it used to be. Because it's too familiar, I'm not as mindful of that which is going on around me. Because something has become too familiar to me, so I find myself disinterested and and unconcerned. And and to me, I'm at the place where my sensitivity and discernment and perception is off. It has become so familiar to me that I really, truly don't understand the potential and the capability and the power that is before me and around about me. And that is where the people of Jesus' own country, hometown, found themselves in the danger of the familiar. In our text, we find that Jesus had been ministering heavily around the area of the Sea of Galilee and now decides to go back to his hometown of Nazareth for a visit. And Mark begins to tell us about this occurrence. And going back to the old town, one first of all hopes that someone there will remember who they are and give some recognition that they indeed belong there in times past. Uh, uh, Let's see if that is the case with Jesus. For the Bible says that when the Sabbath came, he began to teach uh, in the synagogue. And, well, there was some recognition there because Jews did not let just anyone teach in their synagogues. And, And apparently he had met some requirements to be able to teach there, though we are not told that specifically in the Word of God. And his teachings began to amaze them, for the Amplified Bible says, And many who listened to him were utterly astonished, saying, Where did this man acquire all of this knowledge? What is the wisdom, the broad and full intelligence which has been given to him? What mighty works and exhibitions of power are wrought by his hands? Those that listen, note that Mark says, Many who listen were astonished. Unfortunately, many don't listen and remain blind, but think they know everything. And they were taken by surprise. By the power and the depth of Jesus' thinking and the fact that he performed the miraculous. So what was their reaction? Well, the Bible gives us their reaction in verse 3 where they ask the question, is this not the carpenter? But wait a minute, we, we, don't we know this guy? I believe this is the carpenter. Now, where would that come from? Well, Jesus grew up in Nazareth, living there until he was about 30 years of age, until he began his ministry. And Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55 clearly identifies Joseph's profession as a carpenter. And Jesus, like his earthly father, also had a same profession. He likely apprenticed under Joseph and was the custom of the time. And he would have done his carpentry work in Nazareth and the surrounding areas such as Cana and be known by his trade. But the crowd wants to be absolutely sure about him, so they ask more questions of this one named Jesus. Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him, the Bible says. And the crowd that day was trying to locate him in their memory banks. And it could not have been difficult since he had only been away for about a year and a half. And now comes the sad part of our text. The town folks had known him literally all his life, watched him grow up, perhaps had used his carpentry skills and seen him daily, yet Mark tells us, and they took offense at him. Uh, They refused to accept the authority that he had and and to admit that authority, and they were hurt because of their attitude toward him. And so we must find in this text what Jesus' response was to their disapproval of him. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 4, Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives in his own house as a prophet without honor. What was he saying, preacher? I'll tell you what he was saying. I am and have become too familiar to you and I cannot do what it is I need to do and what it is I want to do in your midst because I have been in your presence so much. I have become too familiar to you because I walked among you every day for many years. I've become too familiar to you because I fellowshiped with you and you looked upon my face time and time again. I have become too familiar to you because you have felt the touch of my hands and have seen the works of my hands. I have become too familiar. You see me just as the carpenter's son. You see me just as Mary's son. You see me just as the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And you see me just as the teenage boy running in the streets and playing games with the children. However, they did not understand who I really was and who I really am and what I can really do do 
uh, the home folk had seen him grow up from a young boy uh, and they were having great difficulty accepting uh, that he was a prophet let alone the Jewish Messiah and they thought they knew him well enough to know uh, that he just couldn't be who he claimed to be uh, oh if they only knew what truly had happened just a few days prior to him coming they perhaps would have seen him differently for in Mark chapter 5 the Bible tells us uh, just one chapter earlier you will find that Jesus uh, had cast out a legion of demons from a possessed man uh, just one chapter earlier you will find that he healed a woman with the issue of blood uh, and just one chapter earlier you will find that he raised a little girl from the dead uh, the miraculous was in their midst uh, the supernatural was in their midst uh, and signs and wonders was in their midst uh, Jesus almighty God robed in flesh uh, desired to do the very same thing for them uh, however he became too familiar to them for the Bible confirms to us uh, that he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Uh, notice that it does not say that he did not want to do many mighty works there, but it says he could not do it there. When we think about that, it should grab our attention. This verse suggests that there was something Jesus wanted to do uh, but could not do it. Uh, that go against the grain of all we know about Jesus. Uh, we know that he is God uh, in the flesh. Uh, we know that through him the world was formed. Uh, we know that he has power over the universe. We know that he took a lad's lunch of a few fish and some bread and fed 5,000. We know that he turned water into wine. We know that he calmed a raging storm. We know that he walked on water. We know that he raised the dead and he healed the blind, the lame, the deaf, and the dumb. What that says to me is that Jesus can do anything he wants to do. How many believe in this house that we serve that same Jesus yet today? The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he he shall not change. I've come to tell you the God of heals is in this house. The God that delivers is in this house. The God that will make a way where there seemeth to be no way is in this house. I've come to tell some believers today that there's nothing that my God cannot do. Well, if you believe that, you ought to clap your hands right now and give God some praise. We ought to have us an old testimony service. Has God ever healed your body? You ought to wave your hand. Has God ever filled you full of the Holy Ghost? You ought to wave your hand. Has God ever delivered you from a life of sin? You ought to wave your hand. Has God ever set you free? That I've come to tell you, there's nothing too hard for God that my God can do anything. Oh, clap your hands and give God praise right now and let him know I believe that he can do anything. He can do anything. Nothing's too hard for him. He can do anything. Everyone shout, there's no limit to God. There's no limit to what the Lord can do, but there seems to be a limit here in this text. Oh, yeah. There's no limit to his power, but a limit of the faith and receptivity of the people of his hometown. While I'm fully convinced that Jesus can do anything without limit, I'm made aware in this passage that we can put limits on what he can do in our midst. I want to tell you right now under the anointing of the Holy Ghost for the next few moments that I have with you, I believe in the sovereign power of Almighty God. Does anybody believe in the sovereign power of Almighty God? I've come, to, I've come to draw a line in the sand and tell you today that I believe that God can do anything at any time, at any place. Does anybody believe that God can do anything at any time, at any place? I've come to tell you today, I, I believe unequivocally that God can do the unanswerable, the undeniable, and the impossible. Is there anybody in this house that believe you serve that kind of God uh, that can do the unanswerable, the undeniable, and the impossible? Uh, I declare today there's no power anywhere greater than the power of God. Uh, I declare there's no power anywhere greater than the power of God. Uh, he can do anything, anytime, any place. Uh, it doesn't matter. All I got to do is just call on the name of Jesus, uh, and he's there to touch me. Uh, I just got to worship him. Uh, and he's there to minister to me. I've come to tell you where Jesus is, anything can happen. Where Jesus is, anything can transpire. Where Jesus is, the miraculous will move in our midst. Yet God can limit himself when it comes to what he will do in our lives. We can stop him from doing mighty works in us. We can stop him from doing mighty works for us and among us. And so with Bible says the people of Nazareth rather than experiencing the joy 
of a new way to live, the way of freedom and hope, continue in their same old tired thoughts of prejudice and hate. Likewise, the people of Israel, of Nazareth, rather, rather than the possessing the powerful moments of healing and deliverance that the Messiah Jesus could have brought to them, left that day with their minds justified at rejecting him. But their sick was still sick. And their lame was still lame. And the blind was still blind. And the possessed were still without deliverance. That day that Jesus walked out of Nazareth, miracles walked out with him. That day that Jesus walked out of Nazareth, the supernatural walked out with him. That day that Jesus walked out of Nazareth, signs and wonders walked out with him. That day that Jesus walked out of Nazareth, the divine demonstration of God walked out with him. I am not going to be a part of a church of the living God. I am not going to be a part of a North Church an apostolic church uh, where the sick stays sick uh, and the lame stays lame uh, and the blind stays blind uh, and the possessed stays possessed. Uh, I am going to understand and know and recognize uh, who is in my midst uh, and declare that Jesus uh, can do anything. And I tell you right now, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, uh, this world is not looking for just another church. Uh, you have church after church after church after church. Uh, this world is not looking for another meeting just to get together and tell you how good you are and how proud they are of you. Uh, and you leave the same way you came. Uh, we don't need another church service uh, just feeling good uh, and leaving the same way we walked in here. What we need is the demonstration of God. Uh, what we need is the power and the unction of the Holy Ghost uh, where people will leave this place different uh, than when they came. Uh, I'm tired uh, I'm tired of church, having church as usual. Well, if you believe that, clap your hands right now and give God praise. I believe if a lame man walked into this house, he could be healed. I believe if a blind man walked in this house, he could be healed. I believe if a demon-possessed man walked in, he can be healed through the power of the Holy Ghost. I recognize and understand who's in this house, and I'm not going to let it become familiar. And so when he left Nazareth, shout the place of the familiarity. And he and his disciples found themselves in the region, round about Nazareth, places of belief and expectation, and believing and knowing the power of this one named Jesus. Listen to this. Our very next chapter in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 13. Notice that before Jesus got to Nazareth, uh, there were miracles, signs, and wonders. Uh, while Jesus was there, he did a few little miracles and then left because of their unbelief, uh, because of the place of familiarity. But then you go to a few verses later in that very same chapter, dropping down to verse 7 through 13. Uh, a few verses later, the Bible says that great and mighty miracles were wrought, uh, and they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and they were healed. Notice it wasn't in Nazareth. It was in the surrounding area that they accepted the Lord and had expectation and understood and realized who he really was. I declare to you today under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that when Jesus leaves the place of familiarity and is in a place of expectation, nothing's too hard for him. When Jesus leaves the place of familiarity and is in a place of expectation, nothing's impossible for him. When Jesus leaves the place of familiarity, as in a place of expectation, he can do anything and everything. When Jesus leaves the place of familiarity, as in a place of expectation, miracles, signs, and wonders will be demonstrated. Does anybody have a spirit of expectation on you this morning? Does anybody have a spirit of anticipation on you this morning? That at any moment, at any time, any place in the service, the power of God can fall. That at any moment, any time, any place in the service, someone can stand to their feet and shout, I'm healed, I'm healed. Oh, I wish. I had somebody to help me this morning. Is there an apostolic man or woman that will understand and know and declare I have a level of expectation that at any moment and any time there's someone that can be delivered from the demonic presses of the devil. I've got expectation today. There's some of you, there's some of you sitting right there declaring to yourself that the people of Nazareth were foolish in that which they did. There are some that will read this text and declare that the people of Nazareth were reckless in their thinking and they were idiotic to let Jesus walk out of their midst in the manner that he did because they allowed themselves to fall to the danger of the familiar. Well, may I tell you today that many times in our churches we do the very same thing. We do the very same thing. We fall into the danger of the familiar. I've come to tell you today that we are a blessed people. We are a privileged church because we don't have to pray for apostolic power. It's here. 
Can I tell you that we're a privileged church and we're a blessed church because we do not have to pray for apostolic anointing. It's here. We don't have to pray for apostolic faith. It is here. We don't have to pray for apostolic ministry and demonstration. It is here. We see many every month receive the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. We see many going down in water and immersion in the name of Jesus. We see demons cast out and we see leg braces come off just a few weeks ago. Elder Copley on a Wednesday night, I think it was, or maybe a Sunday morning, walked into this house with a brace on his leg and couldn't hardly walk. And we began to worship and magnify God and just simply laid hands on him and said, by the authority of the Word of God, and by the power of the name of Jesus, receive your healing now. And within just a 30-second period of time, he took that leg brace off and began to dance across the front, worshiping and magnifying God. We don't have to pray for the miracle-working power of God. It is here. We see deaf ears open in pain, leave bodies and healings of every sort wrought in the lives of the people of God. We see the demonstration and power of God in every service where it interrupts our schedule and God does the work that only he can do. However, if we're not careful, we will find ourselves in a place of danger, the place of the familiar. Can I preach to you just for a few moments where we'll declare, oh, I've seen that before. Ah, you got to be careful when you've been in Pentecost all your life uh, and you've been raised in Pentecost because these things then become familiar to you uh, and it doesn't cause you to stand up in awe and reverence anymore because it's just ho-hum, it's just status quo. Uh, and we say, I've experienced that before and, and I've watched that before and I, I felt that before and I've seen that miracle before. I've seen God demonstrate his power like that before. Oh, okay, just another one baptized in Jesus' name. Oh, okay, another one just received the Holy Ghost. Okay. Another one was just healed. Oh, okay, another one was just delivered. I, I know I've walked with Jesus for many years, and I know that I have seen Jesus uh, do many great things. Uh, it has become too familiar. It has become the status quo. Uh, it has become old hat to us. Uh, we don't rejoice like we used to rejoice uh, when someone's healed and delivered. I'm going to preach to you whether you want me to preach to you or not. We don't shout like we used to shout when someone's healed and delivered. We come to church with our arms crossed and saying, God, you've got to take a bulldozer to move me before I'll do anything. My God, don't you remember what it was like when you were a new convert and you came into this house and God filled you full of the Holy Ghost and baptized you in Jesus' name and you felt something you never felt before? Don't let it become status quo to you. Can I preach to you? I'm almost done. Can I preach to you just a little? I love you. Don't get mad at me. I'm trying to help you to understand that if we become familiar to the things of God, the, the miracles are going to walk out of this house. Deliverance is going to walk out of this house because it becomes familiar. I'll never forget one time there was a new convert. Man, he was wild. Every time the music would begin to play, he would shout and worship God. I remember every time someone received the Holy Ghost, he'd run around the church. Every time someone would be healed, he'd shout and rejoice and, and give God praise and glory and adoration to the point where I had to tell him, man, you got to calm down just a little bit, man, because he was just going crazy. He said, Pastor, he said, you don't know what the Lord's done for me. He said, you don't know where the Lord's brought me from. He said, if I did that in the world, I can do that in the church. He said, if I dance at a honky-tonk bar, then, honey, I can dance in a church when the power of God falls on this house. I said, yes, sir, you're right. I'm leaving you alone. You're right. And so he began to worship and magnify God every service. Man, he was on fire, fire of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, there was a, a lady of the church that came up while I was talking to him and said, Honey, just give it some time, and it'll become, you'll become used to it. And it won't affect you like that. Just give it some time. I looked, I got mad. It wasn't the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost had nothing to do with it. I was mad. I got so red from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. My vein popped out of my neck. And I said, honey, that's what's wrong with you. You haven't clapped your hands in three years. And you haven't stood to your feet in three years because it's become common to you. Don't forget that God delivered your husband from alcohol. Don't forget your kids were backsliders. And God brought them in. I said, never tell this man to get used to it. I've come to tell somebody right now, God is great and greatly to be praised. And I am not going to become familiar with what God is doing if I'm not careful. The Holy Ghost, miracles and signs and wonders will walk out. Is there anybody in this house that will declare, keep on worshiping like you used to worship. Keep on dancing like you used to dance. Keep on magnifying God. 
Oh, clap your hands and give God praise right now. I declare I'm not going to get used to it. It's not going to come old. I want the miracles to stay. Hey, I feel the Holy Ghost. Can I, can I just be Pat? Well, I don't need permission. I'm going to be pastor anyway. Elbow your neighbor and say, get your seatbelt on. We're about to go on a ride. All right? There's some that's not in awe and reverence any longer when it comes to the power of God. I've seen it and you've seen it. You eat chips in church. That's not right. You bring these family-sized pitchers of punch and you drink in the house of God when the power of God is moving. That's not right. Why do you do that? Because you become too familiar to the presence and the power of God. I think I'll clap for myself. We're walking in a danger zone. Those of you that come to the house of God and people are shouting and worshiping, you're playing on your cell phone, uh, talking to a neighbor, what you're going to do after church uh, when God is trying to bring a demonstration. Be careful. Be careful. You're walking to a danger zone and God will leave this house uh, because uh, of the familiarity. Is there a man or woman that will say, God, I'm not going to get used to you. I want your power. I want your anointing. I've come to tell you right now, it's not time to write notes in church. And it's not time to elbow your neighbor and talk to your neighbor when the man of God's trying to bring forth the word of God. It's not time to get up 33 times and go out and stand in the hall. God is wanting to do a work. And God is in this house to bring miracles, signs, and wonders. Come on, is there a child of God that'll say, God, I want it, I want it. Miracles stay, provisions stay, supernatural stay. I want you to stand to your feet and raise your voice and clap your hands and shout unto God and say, God, it's not going to become familiar. It's not going to become familiar. I want to see the demonstration of God stay. I want to see signs and wonders stay. I want an unprecedented move of God to stay. I want to see the undeniable, the unanswerable, and the unexplainable stay. Miracles greater. The supernatural greater. Signs and wonders greater. The undeniable greater. Come on, I need someone to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. It's been prophesied to this church that we're going to usher in a move of God like we've never seen before. But the move of God cannot become familiar. The move of God cannot become status quo. It's got to stay. That's it. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. God is moving on the hearts and minds and spirits of those of you that's been in Pentecost for a long time. It's become familiar to you. It's become that is quo to you. It's become ho home to you. Come on, let a new and fresh anointing come on you. Let a fresh vision come on you and recognize who's in your midst and recognize the King of Glory is in this house. Here's what we're going to do right now. I'm done. I've got more notes, but I'm done. I don't need music right now, nor do you. This is not for me. Brother Dave, the Holy Ghost is on you right now. Brother Dave, get out of that pew. Raise your hands right now. Walk down that aisle. There's a fresh anointing about to come on you right now. From the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Jesus is in this house. The supernatural is in this house. Miracle signs and wonders are in this house. It is not going to become common. It is not going to be familiar. 
Brother Smith, pray for him right now. In the bowl, shut up. Come on, raise your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost right now. All across this building, I know what I have. I know what's here. The miracle worker is in this house. I want you to turn to your neighbor, everyone all across this building, and look at them right square in the eye and tell them, I am not going to walk in the danger zone of familiarity. Tell them. Come on, tell them right now. Look at them right square in the eye and tell them, I am not going to walk in the danger zone of the familiarity right now. My God, I've come to tell you. I've been in the, I feel the Holy Ghost. Can I preach to you about another three minutes? I've been in this thing all my life. I was born and raised in this. I was brought to church when I was two weeks old. And the only times I've missed church is either when I've been sick or on vacation. And there's a lot of times I'll walk into this house sick in body because I understand and know who God is. But I've come to tell you, it's not getting old. It's getting better. Better and better and better and better and better and better and sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Anybody here who declare, Pastor, I stand with you. It's not going to be familiar. I recognize who I am and who he is and what God can do. You know what needs to happen? Elder Brian touched on it today. There needs to be a call of repentance. Not of sin. He said when you repent, the rain will fall. When we repent of allowing the things of God to become familiar and we don't stand in awe and reverence, the power of God is just coming at the anointing of God is just selling this. Miracles and wonders are in this. There needs to be repentance of apostolic people that allows the spirit of God to become familiar and allows miracles and signs and wonders that will become familiar. For when I tell you, when you get to a place where you realize and understand that you're serving the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and repentance gets a hold of you, the rain is going to fall. Blessings and provisions are going to fall. And the miraculous is going to fall. Is there a man of God, a woman of God in this house that will raise your hands right now and repent before God and say, God, I'm going to never take you for granted. Complacency is not going to get a hold of me. Lethargy is not going to get a hold of me. Come on right now. Say, God, you become too familiar. Your house has become too familiar. Your presence has become too familiar. And I repent of it right now in the name of Jesus. I repent of it right now in the name of Jesus. I repent of it right now in the name of Jesus. I remember what you've done for me. I remember where you pulled me out of. I understand and know that just the mention of your name, the miraculous will fall in this house. God, we don't want you to leave this house because of familiarity. I don't want Ichabod to be written across the church door where the glory has departed. But God, I want miracles like never before. Come on, raise your voice right now. Raise your voice right now. There needs to be an apostolic mama. Lethargy's gotten a hold of you. Complacency's gotten a hold of you. The awe and reverence of God is lacking in your life. There needs to be an apostolic dad that'll say for my sake and my family's sake and my ministry, I need to repent before God right now. Are you ready? The miracle packer of God is about to fall in this house. Signs and wonders are about to fall in this house. I want you to turn to somebody. And lay your hand right on their forehead. And declare, I know who's in this house. I know the redeemer is in this house. I know the way maker is in this house. I know the provider is in this house. I know the healer is in this house. And now now begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. That's it. Raise your voice. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Raise your voice. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Declare the name of Jesus. I lose miracles. I lose signs and wonders. I lose the touch of the Holy Ghost. I lose the miraculous in this house. For we recognize who you are. We recognize who you are. Uh, that's it. Let intercession get a hold of you right now. Let intercession get a hold of you right now. The King of Glory is walking in this house. The Shekinah Glory of the Holy Ghost is walking in this house. You're a privileged people. You're a privileged people. There are people in our day and hour that never felt what you feel every day. They never experienced what you experience every day. You're privileged. That's it. Pray in the Holy Ghost and raise your voice.
now. Come on, raise your hands as high as you can raise them right now. That's it, raise your hands as high as you can raise them right now. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and say, God, I want your miracles to stay. I want signs and wonders to stay. I want them to be greater than they've ever been before. Greater miracles, greater provisions, greater touch of God, greater blessing. That's it, men, walk and pray. That's it, ladies, walk and pray right now. Saints of God, pray in the Holy Ghost. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? Don't let the presence of God become familiar. Don't let the presence of God be status quo. Say, I'm going to walk in it. There's a door open before me. I'm going to move in it. There's a calling on my life. There's a deliverable. There's strength on my life. The supernatural's on my life. And I'm going to walk in it. Would you take your neighbor by the hand one more time and pray in the Holy Ghost? Let a renewing come on you of expectation. Let a refreshing of expectation come upon you. Let a renewing of all and reverence come upon you. And declare every time I come to the house of God, my mind's going to be focused. Every time I come to the house of God, my worship is going to be focused. Every time I come to the house of God, my faith is going to be focused. I'm putting away the paper and the pens. I'm putting away the iPhone. I'm letting my mind be obedient to God. And I'm not going to let my mind wonder. It's about the power and the demonstration of God and recognizing who it is I worship and recognizing who it is that's in this house. For I don't want him to leave this house with miracles. I don't want him to leave this house with a supernatural. I want miracles in the supernatural greater than I've ever had before. You are good, always good. I'm That's it. I want a man to find another man and a woman to find another woman and pray in the Holy Ghost right now. And say, together we're going to see God do a great work. Together we're going to see the demonstration of God. Together we're going to see signs and wonders like we've never seen before. Together we're going to see the miraculous like we've never seen before. You are good, always good. I'm standing on your promise. I will wait, I will wait for you. Don't be far from me. I'm here. Here, right where you stand, begin to call on the name of Jesus. Uh, let him recognize and hear your voice right now. Let him recognize and hear your voice right now. That's it, right where you stand, begin to call on the name of Jesus. Uh, and the miraculous will rest upon you. The provisions of God will rest upon you. The touch of God will come upon you right now. Come on, God. Uh, God, don't love me. God, don't run from me. God, don't walk away from me. God, don't leave my place. God, don't leave my city. God, don't leave my life. I've come to tell some right now because of complacency and lethargy. Jesus is about to walk out of your life. Jesus is about to walk out of your life. You need to run after him right now and declare, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me today. Have mercy on me today. Have mercy on me today. I need you in my life. I need you in my home. I need you in my family. I need you in my ministry. I need you this day. You are good, always good. 
That's it. Just love him right now and let him touch you. That's it. Just love him right now and let him bless you. That's it. Just love him right now and let the touch of the Holy Ghost. That's it. One more time. Raise your hands and say, God, I give you my mind. God, I give you my heart. I give you my spirit. God, I give you everything I need. Right God, I give you my wants and my desires. And God, every day of my life, I'm going to be aware of your presence. Every day of my life, I'm going to be aware of your power and your anointing. Every day of my life, I'm going to be aware of your spirit in my life. And I'm not going to take it for granted. It's not going to become familiar to me. It's not going to become familiar to me, God. I recognize and know who you are. I recognize and know what you are today. And I thank you. I'm a privileged person. I'm a privileged person in the kingdom. Here's what I want you to do right now. If you're standing in a particular pew, I want you to lay your hand on that pew right now, if you would. All across this building in closing, I want you to lay your hand on that pew that you sit in every service. It may even be a different pew that you're sitting in right now. Elder Smith, stay right here and keep your hand on this pulpit. And we're going to pray for every pew in this sanctuary. Ushers, I want you to lay your hands on those doors that come into the sanctuary right now. And we're going to pray that as soon as we walk into this house, uh, there'll be an expectation that'll come upon us like never before. There'll be an awe and a reverence that'll come upon us like never before. And we'll recognize and understand uh, and knowing who it is we serve and who it is is visiting us that day, that hour. And that the miracle working power of God and the supernatural touch of God and apostolic faith and apostolic ministry and apostolic anointing uh, is going to be greater in this house uh, than it's ever been before, than we've ever seen before because of us recognizing who's here. I want you to lay your hands on it right now and begin to speak the word of faith. Uh, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Begin to lay hands on that and begin to believe that God is going to do that work. Your family's going to sit in those pews. Your family's going to rest in those pews. Your family's going to stand in those pews. There's people of God that's going to come that needs help and healing that's going to stand in those pews. We need to be a church of all in reverence. We need to be a church that's understanding who is in our midst. Every time I gather, God, I receive from you right now. God, every time we gather in this house, let there be an all and reverence come upon us and that the miracle working power of God would be demonstrated like never before and that God, we would see the manifested power of God operate in our life. I thank you for it right now in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for it now in the name of the Lord Jesus. If you have family members that's not here today that need healing and deliverance, raise your hands. I'm going to speak the word of faith. If you have family members that are backsliders, I'm going to speak the word of faith right now. God, by the authority of your word and the power of the name of Jesus. God, I speak the word of faith right now. I speak the word of faith right now. I pray that divine healing would come into their body. I pray a divine touch of the Holy Ghost would rest in their life right now. God, I pray you bring backsliders home in the name of the Lord Jesus.
closing, why don't you thank God for what he's going to do in our midst. Thank God for what's coming down the right. Thank God for what's coming our way. Thank God for what's coming to your family. God, I give you praise and glory. I thank you for it right now. I thank you for it right now. I thank you for that healing. That's it declared in the name of Jesus. There's life and death in the power of the tongue. There's life and death in the power of the tongue. I thank you for it, Jesus. 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 Thankful, would you put your hands together and give God praise all across this building and let your neighbor know I'm coming with expectation and awe and reverence to God. Lord, I thank you today. Lord, I thank you for your power. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your anointing today.